And our first speaker to come forward is Julie Huntsman. Ms. Huntsman, please come forward. Thank you, Ms. McBride and DC staff, and for the courtesy shown to me. Um, I'm Julie Huntsman. I'm a council member of the town of Otsego. Uh, I live in Fly Creek, New York. I'm also co coordinator of elected officials to protect New York, which is a statewide bipartisan coalition, over 800 members strong, and representing every county in this state. Uh, first, thank you, DEC, for extending the comment period for 30 days. As an elected official, I can attest this is a really difficult time of the year between local elections and working on our budgets. Truthfully, I've not been able to examine this issue in great detail, but I know many other elected officials are in a similar situation. Given that, and that these regulations stand to impact municipalities considerably, I urge the DEC to further extend the public comment period and to make specific outreach to local elected officials, including additional public information sessions. This is, would seem to be particularly critical for New York City, Long Island, and Buffalo. It's difficult and often unrealistic for people to come to Syracuse or Albany, especially midweek. As a municipal official, many parts of these proposed regulations concern me. I'll, I'll mention three. Uh, number one, they're quite vague about siting requirements and restrictions. There are no specific objective criteria for determining where LNG facilities can be built, where different size facilities can be built, or setbacks from sensitive areas like streams, schools, hospitals, daycare centers, etc. Additionally, there's no scientific basis or background for determining, determining the risk and inherent dangers of the various forms of LNG facilities, nothing to inform what the impacts would be. From a municipal standpoint, this is unacceptable. It contravenes our duty to protect our citizens. Similarly, the regulations call for a description of environmental impact of proposed facilities, but no firm requirements for protecting our environment, our air, or our water quality. Again, this is unacceptable for unacceptable for municipalities and individuals who could be affected. Two, municipal costs associated with these trucks and facilities. The proposed regulations do not address the social and municipal costs that would come from additional wear and tear on roadways with LNG trucks, building of LNG infrastructure and facilities, strain on bridges, or other social and municipal impacts. This is a glaring omission. We know that these trucks, these LNG trucks, tend to be very heavy, heavier than typical tractor trailers, thus posing potentially significant impacts on our roof and bridges. What will these impacts on our bridges, many of which are old and already strained, be? Will municipalities be left to pay for the damage? What about our highways, for which funds are diminishing? The New York State Department of Transportation already has a growing backlog of unfinished repair projects. Will LNG facilities, infrastructure, and additional trucks require more road and bridge inspection, maintenance, reconstruction, and replacement? Number three, many rural communities, mine included, rely on volunteer emergency responders and firefighters. The proposed regulations call for applicants to offer relevant training to firefighters, but there's no testing and the requirements are inadequate to ensure that emergency responders have the appropriate expertise, personnel, and resources to deal with potential LNG accidents. In short, the proposed regulations are vague, they're narrowly constructed, and insufficient on the issue of emergency preparedness, leaving many municipalities and their citizens at risk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Julianne Skinner. Can you turn up the volume? We can't hear in the back. Sure. One second. Ms. Skinner, if you could just come forward and hold your remarks for one second. We'll see if we can turn the volume up. Also, if you're reading from written comments, would you please uh, give me a copy of them after you've given your remarks and the court reporter can use that with her transcript. Okay. Um, why don't you go ahead and we'll have someone come in in a minute. Just speak right into the microphone, please. Thank you. My name is Julianne Skinner, Montrose Borough Council person, Pennsylvania don't have a prepared speech. I just want to um, offer some experience-based knowledge, uh, particularly with respect to the roadways. The trucks are heavier by 2,000 pounds, and the added wear and tear um, does present a problem. We certainly have that in Pennsylvania, and the municipalities are left to deal with that. Also, it doesn't seem this is inherently dangerous, this liquid natural gas. And there's very little said um, with respect to transportation. There's seven lines that um, I think it's section uh, 570.4. That's not enough. These trucks are on the roadway, present a danger. I don't know how many of us have grandchildren, children, drivers. 
um, more needs to be done. Um, and I don't think that what's in these nine pages is enough. Um, while NCOM does talk about um, economic benefits of LNG, that's really not really not their primary mission. Thank you. Thank you. Dominic Calasaro. Hello, my name is Dominic Calcellaro. I am a common council member here in the city of Albany, New York. I represent part of the uh, south end of Albany, very close to the uh, port of Albany. Um, first of all, I want to thank you for the opportunity to address the proposed rule to allow the siting of LNG facilities in New York State. I have concerns about the proposed rules and regulations for siting LNG facilities. Time does not allow me to go into all of the issues I have with the proposed rules. So I would just talk about the issues directly affecting local governments uh, financially. Section 570.2 sub B paragraph 9 references the need for a report to be prepared by an independent qualified person to evaluate the capability and preparedness for local fire departments to respond to an LNG release or explosion. That's scary enough as it is to think that we could have an explosion opening. If the report concludes additional training is needed, the report shall make an estimate of the costs necessary to remediate the deficiencies. That is followed up by sub sub subdivision D, paragraph 3, that states that such required training or equipment necessary for local fire departments to attend an emergency shall be provided by the applicant. The problem, neither of these subsections reference the personnel costs to a municipality to send their firefighters to the necessary training, only that the applicant shall provide the training. Thus, the taxpayers will be at the cost of paying overtime expenses to fire department personnel who are being trained. How many hours will, be, will the training be? At Albany, our fire chief requires all 240 plus firefighters to be trained in any procedure necessary to meet any type of emergency. If this training is eight hours, times that by 240 firefighters, then times that by the overtime pay, one can easily see the financial burden placed on local taxpayers a burden that should be borne by the applicant, not the taxpayers. But no mention of compensation is made in your proposed rule. The same is true for the emergency response training program for local law enforcement, fire and hazardous material response personnel as required uh, in section 570.3 sub B. Uh, I know I'm running out of time here. Uh, this is going to place, a, assuming a huge financial burden on, on local municipalities. Uh, our fire department this year is already 380,000 over its overtime, uh, 4 million of its budgeted for 2013. Uh, and one other issue I have is, is with the part that has to deal with population. Uh, it doesn't talk about population coming in the areas. Albany's population increases by about 70,000 people on the workday. Uh, the population in the rules is, says a half mile radius of a site facility uh, by the census numbers. I don't think the census numbers are including uh, non-residents uh, for the city of Albany. That needs to be changed. So I, I have a suggestion. The is just scrap this proposed regulation as it is written. Begin again with a more sensible comprehensive regulation which will focus on citizens' health and safety rather than on a corporation's profit-making ability. But better yet, simple is better. Just scrap the whole thing, and let's not have another disaster that happened in Staten Island 40 years ago. Thank you. Dr. Steingraber. My name is Sandra Steingraber. I live in Trumansburg, New York. I'm a PhD biologist, and I'm speaking today as a member of Concerned Health Professionals of New York. I'm here to tell you that your proposed draft regulations contain no science. None. And this fact has not gone unnoticed by New York State's scientific and public health community. Traditionally, a public hearing during the rulemaking process is a chance to bring additional data forward that might be relevant to the law. But you, DEC, have given us a different task during this comment period. Your failure to provide an impartial state of the science summary of the environmental and health risks of lifting New York State's 40-year moratorium on liquefied natural gas facilities means that we must bring all the data to you. That work is underway, and what it shows is that DEC's central claim to the public about the regs and in the regs themselves is that the LNG is safe and provides environmental benefits to New York State is nothing more than an industry talking point. 
The source of this statement is what you call the 2011 NYSERDA study that turns out to be a document authored by Expansion Energy, a company deeply invested in LNG technology and fracking, and that is shameful. Here is what the science actually says. LNG has a life cycle carbon footprint roughly the size of coal. That's because immense amounts of carbon-based energy must be used just to liquefy it via extreme refrigeration and because LNG tanks must leak methane by design in order to stay cool. Your regs and the public statements you make about the regs emphasize that LNG's air emissions upon combustion are cleaner than other fossil fuels. That is a misleading sleight of hand statement. Even my 12 year old understands what a life cycle analysis is. Tailpipes are only part of the story. Over its life cycle, LNG is not a low emission fuel. Because of the energy intensive cryogenics, because of methane venting, because flaring is required during regasification, LNG contributes both to smog and climate change. It releases just as much of toxic emissions in places other than the freeway, like our communities. Thus, these regs are not only unsubstantiated by peer-reviewed science, the claims they make are misleading and deceptive, and New York State's public health community will be making this point forcefully and in detail in our written comments. And so will members of the general public, many of the people here, contribute to an online program called 30 Days of Fracking Regs. How many of you can, are writing in those 30 days? So DEC, you're going to get thousands of comments by your deadline. I hope you're ready for that. Uh, Concerned Health Professionals of New York joins together with New Yorkers Against Fracking in calling for withdrawing these regs and starting over. Thank you. Brian Sampson. Good afternoon, Brian Sampson, I'm Executive Director of Unshackle Upstate. Thank you for the opportunity to come and uh, talk to you today about the proposed regulations for the permitting and siting of LNG facilities. The regulations DEC has proposed will put in place appropriate health and environmental safety criteria for LNG and will enable those entities looking to build and operate LNG dispersing facilities in the state of New York to do so. These LNG related requirements will be the most stringent in the nation once they are fully adopted. These proposed regulations have nothing to do with natural gas development but with the use of a more efficient, environmentally safer alternative fuel. DEC's adoption of these regulations will enable the greater use of liquefied natural gas in New York's transportation sector. For the business community that is interested in using natural gas as a transportation fuel, these benefits will include significant cost savings, specifically lower fuel prices as much as 30% lower at today's prices. Natural gas is one of the cleanest burning hydrocarbon fuels available today. It produces lower levels of carbon dioxide and nitrogen oxide and less particulate matter than diesel-based fuels. A greater use of domestic, domestically produced natural gas in the transportation sector means that our nation will rely less on imported oil. Developing a natural gas fueling infrastructure structure represents a path forward to achieving greater energy independence. But it is unfortunate that New York is the only state in the nation that does not allow compressed natural gas fueling storage facilities. Yeah. All right. yeah. all like it. Across the country, long haul trucks and other fleet vehicles are saving on their fuel costs while, re while reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Companies that have been begun using transportation fuel like natural gas include UPS, Verizon, Lowe's, FedEx, and AT&T. The private sector has begun investing in building the necessary refueling infrastructure. Eventually, it will offer the local governments, school districts, and other entities that operate truck fleets with the opportunity to convert their fleets, which will result in the savings for taxpayers and additional environmental benefits. New York's current de facto ban on the use of natural gas as a transportation fuel is bad for New York's companies, it's bad for New York consumers, it's bad for our taxpayers, and it's bad for our environment. For those reasons, we support the regulations that have been proposed. Thank you. Thank you. The next group of speakers to come forward, please, and fill in the seats. Roger Downs, Brendan Neal, Jim Donovan, Rob Desjardins, Maria Tedford. After you've spoken, please uh, move from the front row for us. And our next speaker is Darren Suarez. I'm 
uh, Darren Suarez. I'm with the Business Council of the State of New York, and I appreciate the opportunity to share with you the Business Council's views related to the proposed regulation of uh, liquefied natural gas facilities. I appear before you on behalf of the Business Council members and applaud the Department's resolve to put forth sensible and protective regulations which will allow New York to join the 49 other states in the nation who currently permit, permit LNG facilities. The promulgation of Part 570 will have a positive environmental and economic benefit as it will permit an alternative fuel source that is safe, affordable, and cleaner. It is time that fear and emotions be put aside and for the state to embrace facts and hard science. It has been over 40 years since an empty Staten Island facility collapsed, a, a construction, not an LNG accident, resulting in New York's LNG public policy to significant devi significantly deviate from the rest of the nations. Due to advances in technology and a stable and competitive price of natural gas, many of the historic barriers to LNG deployment have been addressed, making now the time to put New York back on track and reject embracing fear and misinformation. New York can squarely embrace science and reason with the adoption of the proposed regulations. The Business Council supports the promulgation of 570 because it embraces an established and tested national standard and accepted protocols for the design of LNG facilities, as, de as detailed in the National Fire Protection Association codes. The proposed Part 570 do not address the site selection process for LNG facilities. The location of an LNG facility will be controlled by local zoning regulations. And the siting of an LNG facility will occur consistent with local zonings, which is often currently limiting the area of operation for other fuel facilities, including fuel processing, storage, and dispensing. Additionally, owners and operators of proposed LNG facilities would need to demonstrate that the project is needed and in the public interest. The Business Council supports the promulgation of Proposed 570 because it will also be good for, for the environment. Natural gas is in any form, compressed or CNG or liquefied LNG, is one of the cleanest burning hydrocarbon fuels, producing lower levels of CO2 and NOx in particular matter than other fuels. The Business Council agrees that the human action may contribute to climate change and that New York has been and continues to be one of the nation's leader in carbon efficiency states and New York has and continues to be a leader in carbon policy. We support an acceleration of the decarbonization of New York and the world economy in a manner that seeks to meet the needs of the aspirations of the present without compromising the ability to meet the future needs. As a result, the Business Council supports the adaptation of climate policies with co-benefits, like proposed Part 570, which will provide a near-term concrete benefit for both the environment and the economy. So thank you very much uh, today for our comments. We'll be writing written comments in the weeks ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Craig Stevens. And again, I would just remind the audience to please refrain from making comments. Good afternoon. My name is Craig Stevens. I'm a sixth generation landowner from uh, Silver Lake Township, Pennsylvania. I'm also a proud fifth generation New Yorker. My mom's from Oswego. Um, they wouldn't let me bring my, my uh, neighbor's drinking water in, so there's a picture of it when I uh, was in front of the hearing for Marad at Allegria Hotel. I've also had it many times in the building, so I'm wondering why my uh, well water that I had in here earlier today was not allowed in, so maybe we can find out about that. Uh, it's interesting to listen to the industry talk, because I've had plenty of the industry. Uh, they've been drilling the hell out of us in Pennsylvania for the last 10 years, and they'll tell you a lot of things. I'm a landowner with a lease and a half mile of pipeline 16 inch across my property and everything they told all of our neighbors was a lie. They rip them off from day one about uh, the leasing, paying a few dollars an acre when they were paying thousands before. They uh, tell you everything's safe that they're putting in. That's funny. I heard the gentleman earlier talk about how that uh, collapsed, the tank. It did not collapse, it exploded, and, and uh, the roof dropped on people. There's the uh, compressor station, five compressor stations that William has built within 15 months blew up and lit on fire. The explosion was severe enough to rattle windows within a half a mile. I am tired of the industry and the representatives calling these flash fires. That's not what our hazard mitigation plan or first responders called it. I'm wearing the jacket of my father, 63 years Civil Air Patrol emergency management specialist. He would not call an uh, explosion a flash fire if you paid him money, because that's what this is all about, right? Yeah. This is all about the money. I have $100 million in fake million dollar bills that is as good as the promises they made all of us in Pennsylvania. My neighbors aren't getting checks anymore after five years. They're getting bills, if you can believe that. And when they called and asked to get a uh, accounting, they hung the phone up on them. So they're calling the Federal Trade Commission. Good luck with that, guys, in the drilling industry. Um, you know, 
The first thing you look at, we're being told we're liars. That's why I can't bring my water and right I'm lying. I have 161 documents here that the DEP was hiding from the public that prove water was contaminated by gas drilling all over the 40 counties drilling in New York. And I'm hearing the um, Secretary Martin say this is unrelated to gas drilling. Well, li liquefied natural gas, would that be natural gas or methane? Yes, it would. So please stop placating to us. We're not stupid. We're living where this is happening. I have more than 40 neighbors near me that have contaminated water and live with water buffaloes. But I will tell you, I read your, I read your nine pages of inadequate regulations that you should put in the nearest shredder that you can find. And I will read section 59A-43, 14.4.4. The emergency procedure shall include procedures for recognizing an uncontrollable emergency and for taking action to achieve the following. You know, bringing LNG to New York State after an explosion killed 40 people 40 years ago is a bad idea. And bringing anything in that can have an uncontrolled emergency near a school or a church or any other building is ridiculous. I hope the DEC will reconsider, start over, and put some real regulations and teeth in this, or keep LNG out for another 40 years. Thank you. Keith, Duke. Good afternoon. My name is Keith Shu. I live in Sherry Valley, New York, and I'm here today representing myself as well as Otse Sustainable Otsego. I have a master's degree in engineering, and I've worked in the private sector for about 14 years. I've also been involved in environmental conservation and government relations. I have served on various federal, state, and local advisory boards, and I've had the opportunity to review and write policies, regulations, and proposed legislation. When I read these proposed regulations for liquefied natural gas, I do not see a robust set of enforceable rules with clear, measurable requirements. I do not see solid siting criteria criteria pertaining to the location or size of facilities. I do not see clear avoidance or mitigation requirements to protect natural resources. I do not see any effort to limit greenhouse gas emissions, adequate rules for reporting of accidents, adequate safety or liability requirements, or a fee structure capable of supporting the range of facilities proposed. Instead, what I see is an agency that has spent the last 37 years trying to avoid its statutory obligation of regulating this industry and now faced with applicants knocking on its door for permit approval, is still doing that. These regs have a definition section, section in the beginning. They have some references at the end, but there's virtually nothing in between. Offering no added value, they essentially just defer to industry fire codes. To paraphrase what your staff told us in Syracuse, those fire codes already exist, so it would not even matter if these regs went away. DEC, that is, not responsive, that is not responsive to your obligation pursuant to ECL Article 23, Title 17, or your broader mandate as an agency charged with protecting the environment and people of New York. In press releases and interviews, you have said that these rules are intended to facilitate truck refueling stations, basically truck stops. However, your regulatory impact statement reveals something very different, admitting that the regs could open the door to import-export terminals, peak shaving plants, regional production plants, LNG facilities along pipelines, and LNG at gas wells. In fact, recently we learned that the author of DEC's 2011 promulgation report, Expansion Energy, not only has a vested interest in LNG, but has developed and patented, but has developed patented technology for LNG at gas well pads where fracking would occur. It is also quite interesting that the proposed regs carve out a special exception for that technology. This is a major conflict of interest. The bottom line is that you don't have regulations here, and you don't have a credible promulgation report to support what you're doing. The only, the only responsible course of action at present is to withdraw these regs and start over. DEC has announced very publicly that these rules are intended to allow truck refueling stations. So if that is the case, if this is not about deep plants or import-export terminals, or expansion energy's plans for LNG at fracking wells across the southern tier, if it's not about those things, then don't promulgate rules Will, that will allow those things to occur. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Roger down. Again, after you've spoken, um, please move from the front row so we can make room for the next group of speakers. My name is Roger Downs. I'm the conservation director for the Sierra Club Atlantic chapter. We're a volunteer-led environmental uh, advocacy group with 38,000 members statewide committed to protecting New York's air, water, and remaining wild places. When the New York State Legislature enacted Section 23, 1703, the Environmental Conservation Law, 
The legislative intent was clearly focused on protecting public health and safety from the dangers presented by liquefied natural gas. I'll read briefly, the legislature finds that liquefied natural gas and petroleum gas is an extremely volatile, highly flammable, and dangerous substance, which if released into the air is capable under unfavorable atmospheric conditions of causing severe damage, even in areas distant from the point of release. It is for this reason that we are concerned the DEC and the advancement of these regulations after more than 37 years of precaution could declare in secret documents that there is no significant environmental impact associated with the advancement of siting regulations for LNG facilities. In the environmental assessment form, the DEC cites several studies conducting uh, by NYSERDA uh, in recent years uh, demonstrating some level of safety associated with LNG storage and transport that negates any further need for review. Uh, the Sierra Club cautions that such studies cannot supplant a legitimate environmental impact statement that includes public scoping and input. Neither report from 1998 or 2011 includes analysis of greenhouse gas emissions and contributions to climate change, impacts to wildlife and biodiversity, secondary and cumulative impacts to communities, and community planning or impacts to cultural, agricultural, or rural resources. The Sierra Club asks that the DEC rescind the negative declaration and conduct a full environmental review that take these issues into consideration. Um, we also have concerns about uh, the incorporation by reference of the National Fire Protection Association standards. They really are the substantive core of these regulations, uh, and yet uh, we really don't have any idea how these standards uh, that the public cannot change, cannot interface with, uh, and, and uh, have trouble accessing, how that interfaces with a legitimate SAPA process that favors transparency and public involvement. Um, the CR Club, along with many other advocacy groups, we don't want our opposition to the current regulatory framework to be misconstrued as insensitivity to environmental justice communities that want cleaner fuel emissions alternatives to the diesel trucks and buses that rumble through their neighborhoods and foul the air they breathe. But we also don't want to make a blind commitment to LNG infrastructure expansion that could lead to unwanted climate change impacts and undermine the real transportation and energy solutions that are based upon efficiency, innovation, and renewable energy generation. Uh, please do a full EIS on this. Thanks. Thank If you're reading from written comments, would you please give me a copy for the court reporter? Brendan Neal, please. Uh, my name is Brendan Neal, and I work for a small seven-person startup in upstate New York called Green Buffalo Fuel. Green Buffalo Fuel is developing a vehicular LNG solution for the heavy trucking markets. You've heard people say that these regulations open the door for the build of fracking infrastructure, whatever that means. This is not at all what these regulations do. In reality, what these regulations do is open the door for improved air quality and overall quality of life. I'm here today to support you, the DEC, as you promulgate these rules for the dispensing of LNG. By allowing LNG in New York, you are not only fulfilling your mission, you're saving thousands of lives. How many lives? According to a recently released study by MIT, there are 53,000 premature deaths in the U.S. annually from the particulate matter found in vehicular exhaust. Of these 53,000 premature deaths, 4,700 occur in New York State. And we're not talking about a few months of lost life, or maybe a few years. The report found that, on average, 12 years of life were lost. 12 years. That's the difference between living into your 60s or your early 80s. Now, imagine having to say goodbye to your parents or grandparents 12 years earlier than necessary. This sad reality happens to thousands of New York families every year, and the worst part is that these deaths are preventable. Natural gas vehicles have been found to be much cleaner than gasoline or diesel powered vehicles. Beyond attaining a 20 to 30 percent reduction in total emissions, natural gas powered vehicles achieve a 90 percent reduction in particulate matter emissions. As diesel powered vehicles can be converted to operate primarily on LNG, and there's a huge fuel savings incentive to do so, we can achieve massive reductions in our particulate matter emissions and therefore premature deaths just by allowing LNG vehicles to fill up in our state. Now, other states have taken notice of the emissions reductions attained with natural gas vehicles. For example, in California, where there's over 5,700 premature deaths per year attributable to the particulate matter found in vehicular exhaust, they have adopted a very progressive strategy to try to combat this problem. 
in the ports of LA and Long Beach, all trucks entering the ports must be powered by clean alternative fuels, including LNG. This saves the citizens of California cities from the exposure to thousands of tons of particulate matter emissions and volatile organic compounds every year and is contributing to improved air quality for its citizens. Further, other ports along the coast are considering similar measures. Watching other states embrace the enormous societal, human health, and environmental benefits of using natural gas powered vehicles, while New York grapples over allowing cleaner, safer LNG powered vehicles pains me. To sit by and watch our friends, families, and neighbors die prematurely of preventable ailments is a tragedy, but one that we can rectify by enacting the proposed rules. The rules will provide for the safe fueling of LNG powered vehicles by enacting some of the strictest safety standards and building codes found across the country, it will give long-haul truck fleets a safer, cleaner, alternative to diesel fuel, and it will go a long way towards improving our air quality here in New York. For the above reasons, I urge the DC to adopt the proposed regulations. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jim Donovan, and the next group to come forward, Jody Schoenfeld, Cesar Don, Karen White, Leo Cortizo. Go ahead, Tony. Good afternoon. Um, Jim Donovan from Buffalo, New York. I'm um, speaking to you as an engineer and having first-hand experience with LNG myself, um, and I also have several years' experience as a volunteer firefighter. I just wanted to briefly talk about the safe handling of LNG. I uh, want to talk about how unsafe it is. Uh, it's not nearly as different as any other fuels that we use today, uh, between diesel, uh, gasoline, or even electricity. They all can be very dangerous if handled inappropriately. The difference is with LNG is if you know how to understand, if you can understand those circumstances, you can uh, manage them and you can control it safely. In my 15 years of firefighting background, I would actually rather roll up to a scene of an LNG truck rolled over with or without LNG leaking anywhere because it's lower density, the fuel just evaporates, it's gone, it's in the atmosphere well before we probably even get there about half the density of air, so its uh, vertical velocity is usually pretty high. Um, it's a lot easier to contain. Uh, li the liquid just instantly ev evaporates as soon as it touches the ground, and it's um, a lot less of a hazard to us. Um, it's not as dirty, uh, it's not as uh, explosive when uh, in the hazardous environment. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Rob, is your then? Hi, uh, my name is Rob Desjardins. I'm also an engineer. I'm a master's degree in engineering. I work as a design engineer in Buffalo for a small company that focuses on uh, cryogenic storage vessels. Um, I'm not here to talk about fracking. The regs don't talk about fracking. I'm here to talk about natural gas as a transportation fuel. Uh, there's lots of ways to harvest natural gas, uh, like organic digesters, um, and uh, tying this with fracking is, is, isn't uh, isn't, um, it isn't as relevant as, as the, uh, sorry. Uh, all right, I'm sorry about that. Um, so LNG is, is not fracking fluid. Um, it doesn't have to do with fracking. Uh, just like ice and steam are the same thing, they're just water. Um, LNG is just natural gas that's been cooled down and condensed into a liquid. Um, I like to think about running steam through a freezer. It's the best way to think about how LNG is, is produced from natural gas. Uh, natural gas has the best safety record of any fossil fuel. I get my info on natural gas from the National Institute for Standards and Technology. Uh, it's available at nist.gov. I encourage you to uh, check any of my facts there. Um, natural gas is safer than any other fossil fuel because of many factors. It has a high temperature uh, auto ignition of 1076 Fahrenheit versus, for example, 410 degrees Fahrenheit for diesel. Uh, it has a very high lower flammability limit, 0.6% uh, is diesel's lower flammability limit, which is the percent by volume uh, in air that it needs to combust, and LNG is, needs 5%. I'm sure if anybody's ever spilled diesel, uh, you know how dangerous it is and how quickly it'll, uh, it'll ignite. And a uh, liquid natural gas can't burn, only the vaporized, um, only vaporized natural gas can burn. A uh, liquid is too rich to burn. Um, the storage vessels that we use to contain liquid natural gas are extremely robust, double-walled stainless steel uh, vessels compared to thin aluminum used for diesel vessels. Um, LNG is non-toxic. You can spill it into water. 
and let it evaporate and drink the water just fine. Uh, it doesn't absorb into the water. Uh, liquid is lighter than liquid natural gas is lighter than water, and natural gas is lighter than air. Uh, many fleets already use CNG powered trucks in New York State because it's substantially cleaner than other fossil fuels. That's why it's sent to our homes. I can imagine diesel burners on your stove um, it would be ridiculous. I, I don't know. In conclusion, I, I just want everyone to understand the benefits, uh, both economic and environmental, of using clean natural gas as transportation fuel. And uh, every other jurisdiction in the Northern Hemisphere allows its use, except for in New York. Um, that needs to change. Uh, considering LNG's exemplary safety record, clean burn, domestic availability, cheap cost, and stringent national safety, safety standards, New York needs to allow its use just like every other state does. Thank you. Thank you. Maria Tedford? Hi. Uh, my name is Maria Tedford. I'm also from Buffalo, New York. And I am speaking today to express my support for the TEC for the proposed regulations. After reviewing the proposal, I believe that these regulations are more than adequate to protect the health and safety of New York State residents as well as create in-state jobs and benefit the New York State economy. LNG is simply natural gas that has been cooled to a temperature where it goes from a gaseous to a liquid state. It is the same gas that millions of Americans use to cook their food, heat their homes, and power their gener generators, and have used for decades. In recent years, hundreds of thousands of natural gas vehicles have been built, some of which powered by LNG. From an emission standpoint, these vehicles pollute much less than those powered by diesel or gasoline, and every other state in the country has recognized this. In fact, total emissions from natural gas vehicles may be 20 to 30 percent lower than conventionally fueled vehicles. Additionally, when compared to conventional fuels, such as diesel or gasoline, it has, as the gentleman before me stated, a lighter auto, uh, lighter auto ignition temperature, a higher minimum flammability limit, and it is lighter than air. All of this, coupled with the lower cost of LNG, makes it an attractive fuel source, and New York State could greatly benefit from the promulgation of these proposed regulations. All in all, New York State's current prohibition makes it much less competitive, less clean, and less safe than every other state in the country. Therefore, I believe that the proposed regulations are a step in the right direction for New York State, and that we will benefit economically and environmentally from its passage. Thank you. I have a copy of your remarks for our court report. Sure. Jody Schoenfeld. Hi, my name is Jody Schoenfeld. I'm a resident of Columbia County. I'm neither a scientist nor am I an engineer. I have no numbers to share. Statistics can and have often been manipulated to serve one's cause and pocketbook. I am speaking today as a mother, a grandmother, and a human being concerned with healthy living. I am a member of NE3 Albany, no extreme energy extraction. My husband, who is a board certified internist and cardiologist, and I, are most concerned about the negative health impact caused by extreme energy extraction and all its ramifications. For the sake of our children, our grandchildren, and all future generations, please think forward, not backward. We don't need more fossil fuels. The earth as we know it will not and cannot continue to survive even at our current rate of consumption. Do not pass these non-regulating regulations. Invest in renewables for the preservation of New York State, the USA, and the world. Thank you. Stays are down as our next speaker, and the next group to come forward, Brett Berry, Dennis Ding, Wes Gillingham, Russ Haven, Clark Rose. And again, if you have made your remarks on the record, if you'd like to leave the room to make room for our other speakers, that would be great. Thank you. Mr. Don, go ahead. Thank you for the opportunity to address this meeting. My name is Don Kayser. I'm living in Niskeuter, New York. Over the next 10 years, 
Most trucking on our national interstate highways will be fueled by LNG. The simple fact that LNG saves trucking companies about half on the fuel cost will drive this change. Currently, there are 76 LNG fueling stations in the interstate highways. Clean Energy Company is planning a total of 150 over the next year, couple of years. But none of these are planned for New York State. This is the reason LNG fueling stations must be permitted and installed on the throughways and other New York State highways. If this is not done, New York State will be left out. Truckers will scrape around New York City, excuse me, New York State. Our state economy will be hurt. To not have LNG fueling on our highways is equivalent to New York 10 years from now having only dirt roads while the rest of the country have modern highways. Thank you very much. Thank you. Karen White. My name is Karen White, and I'm with the New York State Motor Truck Association. Every day in every state in the nation, including New York, LNG is transported, used, and stored safely in storage facilities. It is increasingly being used in heavy-duty trucks as, clean, as a cleaner, less expensive alternative to diesel fuel. The DEC's proposed addition of Part 570 to allow for the safe sitting and operation of LNG facilities will finally enable the trucking industry and consumers alike to realize the benefits already seen in the other 49 states. Using LNG and natural gas to fuel vehicles reduces greenhouse gas emissions by up to 30% compared to conventional fuels. It is being used across the country as not only an environmentally friendly alternative to other fuels, but as a safe alternative to other fuels. Because LNG is stored at negative 260 degrees below Fahrenheit and at a low pressure, if an LNG storage unit were to rupture, the liquid would spill out, rapidly warm and evaporate, taking approximately two minutes per 100 gallons of LNG to evaporate into the air. LNG is characteristically safer than both propane and butane, which are currently um, used on the highways today. The need for LNG as a transportation fuel has been documented by the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, which studied the safety and economic benefits of LNG. In the trucking industry, LNG is extremely attractive as an alternative to other fuels, as it is, as it is more environmentally friendly, safer, and significantly cheaper for many carriers. Adding the ability for carriers to use LNG in New York would not only increase the likelihood of carriers actually doing business in the state, it would help eliminate the diversion of trucks away from New York. Additionally, the use of LNG would enable New York trucking companies to compete with companies in other states and make transportation costs more affordable for all businesses and consumers. The lack of LNG facilities in New York is keeping transportation costs artificially high and keeping businesses out, ultimately costing consumers more for all goods delivered in the state. The Department of Environmental Conservation's proposed regulations establishing, establishing criteria for the sitting of LNG facilities in New York are an important step to help the state realize the significant environmental and economic benefits of LNG. The fuel is already being transported safely throughout New York every day in all quantities governed by state and federal hazardous material safety requirements without incident. By allowing LNG stations in the state and bringing New York up to speed with the other 49 states in the nation, both businesses and consumers will reap the benefits. Thank you. Oh, can I have your remarks, please? Leor Cortizo? No, for me. That's okay. Good afternoon. Thank you for having us this afternoon. My name is Leo Cortizo, Business Development Manager for Clean Energy Fuels, a member of a group called uh, National Gas, uh, NGV America. I'll be speaking on behalf of NGV America. NGV America is a national organization dedicated to the development of a growing and sustainable market for vehicles powered by natural gas and biomethane. NGV America represents more than 200 companies, including vehicle manufacturers, natural gas vehicle component manufacturers, natural gas distribution and production companies, natural gas development organizations, nonprofit advocacy organizations, state local government agencies, and fleet operators. NGV America strongly supports the issuance of New York regulations and will be filing a statement of support for the record. Thank you very much. Thank you. Brett Barry. Good afternoon and thank you for the opportunity. Uh, my name is Brett Barry. I do policy and regulatory advisory, advising for clean energy fuels. Um, we are supporting this process and we do appreciate that throughout this regulatory process, even before the final regulations were issued, uh, that you had public meetings to, to let everybody voice their opinion. 
and now that the, the uh, regulations are in final format, you've provided two opportunities uh, for people to speak. So that is greatly appreciated. Uh, we started with the uh, with natural gas refueling uh, in Southern California uh, with LNG in response to the increased emissions requirements at the ports. So that's where the LNG trucking uh, uh, really started. Uh, as as mentioned before, there are greenhouse gas reductions that uh, are, have been established by the California Air Resource Board through certifications, looking at approximately a 20% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. Also, as mentioned, it was about a dollar to a dollar fifty savings per gallon, which creates an economic stimulus for New York businesses. Additionally, the engines that are being uh, utilized to burn natural gas are predominantly being made uh, in Jamestown, New York. So it would be odd to have a uh, company which is producing the engines used by the industry but not allowed to operate within the own state. Uh, right now we have built stations in 43 states using the well-established NFPA guidelines which are suggested to be used here and which are appropriate. However, since New York is now creating a permitting process, uh, it has set the bar uh, for standards uh, across the nation. Uh, this is nothing new. LNG facilities are currently operating in New York now that have been grandfathered in. Um, it's not something that is unique to producing states. These are in all states. Uh, a lot of utilities, as discussed before, utilize LNG peak shaving facilities. Uh, what we're talking about is liquefying natural gas, which is, which is already running through the pipelines in New York. This is not contingent upon any future production. Uh, we also do uh, renewable natural gas, biomethane off the of landfills, which we also liquefy. So this isn't solely fossil fuels. There is no other option right now to replace diesel except LNG. So it's a choice between diesel or liquefied natural gas. Some will make the case that electric is possible. Uh, it is not economic and electricity on average is being produced at about 50% natural gas and the other 50% is coal. Also, regarding the uh, extra weight, uh, in New York there is a gross vehicle weight rating, so natural gas trucks are not permitted to be any heavier, though the tanks are about 750 pounds more, they would just have to reduce their payload, so there will be no extra burden on the road systems due to extra weight. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Dennis Ding, and the next groups to come forward, I have Nicole Dillingham, Anne-Marie Garten, Corinne Rosen, Mary Finneran, Bill Kitchen. Those people could come into the front row, please. And if you've already uh, made your remarks, please uh, move to the back of the room or leave the room for other people to come in, please. Go ahead, Mr. Dane. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Dennis Dane. I'm the Vice President of Engineering and Construction with Clean Energy. Um, we have built, I personally oversee the building of over 200 compressed natural gas stations and close to 100 liquefied natural gas stations throughout the country. And I personally work with over hundreds of fire marshals throughout the country to permit these facilities. And um, the NFPA 52 is the guideline used across the country by all these fire marshals to permit, review, and cite all these CNG, compressed natural gas, and liquefied natural gas facilities. Uh, for some fire marshals that is, might not be as familiar about natural gas or liquid natural gas, there are actually uh, a number of very good fire, LNG fire school across the country, including the Northeast Gas, the uh, Colorado uh, School of Mines in Denver, Colorado, and also Texas A&M that provide very good LNG training, fire protection, and fire prevention schools across the country. And for all those fire marshals that uh, uh, need the extra training or knowledge of LNG, we have actually sent groups of those fire marshals to those schools to get training. And after they have the proper training of handling the LNG and LNG fire, they all come back and we have received 100% permit approval for all those fire marshals. So I think once people get to know and have a first-hand handling of the safety, how safe LNG is, um, versus just getting perception from the internet, they will find LNG to be a safe fuel to use as a vehicle of transportation fuel. Thank you. Thank you. Wes Gillingham. I'm Wes Gillingham, the program director for Catskill Mountain Keeper. Uh, one of the earlier speakers here said infrastructure. I'm not sure what that is. Um, and what we're experiencing right now 
is an onslaught of infrastructure via pipelines, compressor stations, and now the new one on the table is LNG facilities. LNG, LNG facilities represent a market for fracked gas. It is connected to fracked gas. Should I say that again? It's connected to fracked gas. It's a market for fracked gas. So the other thing that struck me in some of the other testimony um, is somebody said, oh, this is just like running steam through a freezer. That sounds like my electric bill would go way up if I ran steam through my freezer. Um, and then somebody else spoke to, it's so much cleaner, it's so much cleaner, but let's go back to that. It's a market for fracked gas. Over 1,000 truck trips to an individual well pad to get the frack trip, fracked gas. That sounds like air pollution to me, excuse me. Um, I'm just going to quote something from an uh, industry journal. It was somebody from Dresseran who's talking about these production facilities, these mobile units that are not regulated, that don't come under these regulations, and really have a huge question for me as to whether or not fracked gas from individual well pads will then go to these storage facilities. And it's from, he says, you can produce the LNG and then truck it to locations where putting in the infrastructure and the pipelines doesn't make sense. Somebody from Expansion Energy is also quoted as saying, the VX cycle plants could be deployed on an interim basin until the permanent gas gathering and process infrastructure gets built out. All this speaks to me for the need for the DEC to take a comprehensive look. A full environmental impact statement needs to be done on the LNG facilities not in isolation, but connected to fracked gas. I'll say that again. This is connected to fracked gas. Thank you. Thank you. Josh Haven. Um, Russ Haven, Legislative Council with the New York Public Interest Research Group, and I've heard. Uh, we'll submit detailed comments at a later point. Um, I just. You know, this all goes back to, for New York to Staten Island in 1973. And again, here's what the legislature said. This is the, the mission, this is the directive to the department. Uh, the legislature finds that liquefied natural and petroleum gas is an extremely volatile, highly flammable, and dangerous substance, which if released into the air is capable under unfavorable atmospheric conditions causing severe damage even in areas distant from the point of release. It's the purpose of the legislature subject to the provisions of this act that liquefied natural or petroleum gas facilities not be sited in residential areas or in dangerous proximity to contiguous populations. Here's what NFPA 59A says at the very beginning. That's essentially the the code that has the guts of what DEC proposes to do in terms of its mission in regulating nat uh, liquefied natural gas. It says, the purpose of this standard is to provide minimum fire protection, safety, and related requirements for the location, design, construction, security, operation, and maintenance of LNG plants. That does not sound like it meets the high threshold the legislature set in 1976 in the, in the wake of the uh, tragedy on Staten Island. Uh, regardless of what's happening across the country, New York State has set a much higher bar and these draft proposals failed to meet that standard. Um, Forty years in the making and the proposed regulations are still half-baked. Um, uh, we're shocked that uh, it would allow LNG facilities of any size we're shocked that there's no expanded safety zones, given New York's history and the legislative directive, um, and that there's a legal loophole that DEC has offered up to let uh, the Department of Transportation out of the scheme of regulating uh, truck traffic in New York State. Um, there's no estimates provided on the amount of truck traffic that would increase. Um, and amazingly, the only recent study offered up to support this is, is the 2011 study by NYSERDA uh, drafted by someone who stands to make and probably does make considerable amounts of money not only from fracking patents but by marketing a mobile LNG uh, production process that by the way would not be directly regulated under the draft reg. So the consultant writes the report 
DEC uses it to um, support its proposal, and lo and behold, the consultant's process is off the hook. Um, and in terms of this not being related to fracking, you've heard it all, it does start to look like a Trojan horse. Um, I, I at, urge that you look at the NYSEG 2008 report to um, uh, USDOE. It explains the connection between fracking and LNG and also lays out the whole game plan, how the industry has been lobbying to weaken the state law over the last decade. Thank you. Clark Rose. The three minutes does not allow me to cite my sources, so I will uh, give a quote and you will know that I've moved on to a new source. LNG is a terrorist wet dream, TWD. Terrorists in our country, there are terrorists in our country and they are active. Recently they tried blinding pilots in the New York City area using lasers. Our country, our current Secretary of State John Kerry is on record against citing LNG facilities in populated areas. The late said, uh, Senator Ted Kennedy said, quote, I will tell my colleagues, our state knows, as every state that has an LNG facility knows, that if it were to explode, it would decimate a 50-mile radius. Quote, 90,000 people died from one Hiroshima bomb. Derived from a study of the Pentagon, a modern LNG tanker has the explosive energy of 117 Hiroshima bombs. Quote, LNG is highly volatile, and there the era of terrorism may offer more opportunities for terrorists to strike on vulnerable energy infrastructure targets located near residential neighborhoods. Quote, urban LNG operation creates two targets, the LNG plant itself and an enormous LNG tanker bringing in frozen gas. Quote, there is no economic feasible engineering or design solution that could mitigate the consequences of a large scale LNG release from the vessel's hull. Quote, there is no such thing as a terror proof ship. Quote, Al Qaeda, Al Qaeda has specifically cited LNG as a desirable target. Terminals make much better targets for attack because it could result in massive fire and could potentially kill scores of people. Quote, Al Qaeda has Al Qaeda has a naval manual describing quote the best places on the vessel to hit, how to employ limpid mines, fire rockets, and rocket propelled grenades from high speed craft, and turn LNG tankers into floating bombs. Terrorists have successfully attacked by boat bombs such as the USS Cole and a French tanker. Quote a bolt out of the blue, fast boat loaded with explosives and suicide bombers likely to evade most Coast Guard patrol craft, which are designed primarily for safety patrols and not armed combat. It would take an outboard powered boat packed with explosives, fi traveling 50 miles an hour, less than 21 seconds to pass through the Coast Guard security zone of 500 yards and explode the tanker. Quote, there is nothing safety officials can do in such a case. They would have no time to evacuate people or put out a fire. Like, quote, like the attack of the World Trade Center in New York City, there exists no relevant industrial experience with fires on this scale and measures for securing public safety. Quote, the most catastrophic, catastrophic scenario is terrorists taking control of a tanker, sailing in towards a major population center, and de de detonating the cargo. Quote, despite the myriad of security measures in place, it would be difficult to thwart people uh, willing to die to carry out an attack. Attack as not, such as 9-11 and the bombing as USS Cole serves as reminders that events many industry officials considered improbable are still possible. Remember, a modern LNG tanker has the explosive energy of over 117 Hiroshima bombs. Thank you. Thank you.